Today we are really honoured to have uh, with us a brother from another mother. And when Dr. Dave gets up, you'll see what I mean by a brother from another mother. But you know, Dr. Dave is in demand all over the world, spoken at some of the great, great churches uh, all over the world, including Hillsong, Joel Osteen's church, all around the place, and has a great message for the body of Christ at large. When Pastor Jane and I have known him, his wife, for a number of years now, and we're really thrilled that, you know, despite us being a fledgling pioneer church, uh, he has said, you know, I'd love to come and speak to your church members and to your congregation. And I want us, church, to stand to our feet and I want us to give Dr. Dave a big, big welcome. Come on, church. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Hey, before you sit down, just before you sit down, there you go. Look around you real quick and find someone that's good looking. Don't start laughing. That could hurt their feelings. But uh, find, when you find them, look at them right in the eyes. When you find them, look at them right in the eyes. Tell them this. Tell them the rest of your life. All right. That didn't sound too good. Maybe find someone better looking than that, maybe. Maybe look the other direction or something. Tell them, tell them the rest of your life. Okay, try this. Point to yourself. Say the rest of my life. There, you sounded better when you started talking about yourself. Say, will be the best of my life. Now, one more time, like you really believe life could get better. Say, the rest of my life will be the best of my life. Now, how many believe the rest of your life really could be better? How many, how many believe that? You know, it, it, doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how good things are going for you right now. The rest of your life could be the best of your life. It doesn't matter how bad things are going for you right now. That's the good news is the rest of your life will be the best of your life. John 10, 10 promised it. Jesus said, I've come that you might have what? Life. He didn't say I've come that you might make a living. He said, I've come that you might have life. Now, you might enjoy it. That's what it said. How many believe the Bible? Let's get, let me get that. Okay, that's good, a little over half of you. Wouldn't you hate to find out it wasn't true? That'd be horrible. You ever wonder that? Anybody ever wonder that? Is all this true? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. Did God really write all? Anybody ever wonder that? Be honest. You won't go to hell or anything. Okay, look. I've wondered. I've been in church my whole life. I've wondered, did God really write all that? I mean, there's a lot of stuff in there. I started thinking one day, if God didn't write it, someone had to have. So I started thinking of people I knew. You want to narrow it down, I don't know, maybe Michael Tony wrote it. He don't do a lot. And I found that scripture, if you don't work, you don't eat. I'm like, nope, Michael Tony didn't write that. I mean, you just start thinking about it, you know. You, you know your kids didn't write it. Spare the rods, spoil the child. They wouldn't have put that in there. Maybe my wife wrote it. Submit to your, nope. How many, how many, be honest, how many, if, how many of you wrote the Bible, how many can think of at least three things you would not have put in there? Yeah, look at that. There have been like eight commandments instead of ten, you know. <laughs> Tithing would have definitely been lower, wouldn't it? Like two percent. We'd all change a lot of things if we if we'd have wrote the Bible. Here's what I know. No human being could have ever wrote a standard this high. So if God said it, I just believe it. And he said, I've come that you might have and enjoy life that you might have it in abundance to the full until it overflows. One more time, as you're sitting down, one more time, say the rest of my life will be the best of my life. Uh, you could be seated. I'm going to get you to say that as much as I can because uh, what you continually hear, you'll eventually believe. You know, if you hear your whole life, you're dumb, you're stupid, you'll never make anything of yourself, eventually you start believing that kind of stuff. But if you keep hearing the rest of your life will be the best of your life, pretty soon you'll start believing the rest of your life will be the best of your life. Life is a gift. We just came from Christmas a few weeks ago. How many got some gifts for Christmas? Yeah. Who, how many like unwrapping gifts? Let me see your hand if you like to unwrap gifts. That's, okay, who likes to just tear the paper off? You don't care. All right, who are the careful people that take the paper off slow? Because you can reuse the paper, right? If you're good, if you're slow enough, right? I'm one of those that just rips, I can't wait to get in there. My little boy, he, he will rip, he will open my presents, your presents, it doesn't matter. He loves to just rip open presents. And here's this gift we've got. Now, what I love about this, this gift that God gave us, it's a gift called life. 
He gave us this gift. Now, I remember Christmas, I bought my wife something for Christmas, and I picked it out. Went to the store, mall, and I found just the perfect gift. I'm like, oh, she's going to love this. And I couldn't wait to give it to her because I wanted to see her face when she opened it because I picked it out just for her. You know what I'm talking about? And I'm like, here, open it. And I wanted to watch her because I, I, I hadn't bought everybody the same thing. I didn't go to Sam's or Costco and buy, like, bulk gifts for everybody. And that's kind of like God with this gift called life is he picked out this gift just for you. That's why none of us are alike. The other day someone told me, he said, you know, Dave, you and me, we're just alike. <laughs> I said, you know, if you and me are just alike, one of us is unnecessary. <laughs> and I'm going with you. You know, none of us are just alike. I mean, I can't be you and you can't be me. I got to be who God created me to be. I can't be Pastor Ashley. I love Pastor Ashley, but I can't be him. I can't preach like him. I, 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 I got to be me. We, I got the same haircut, but that's about, that's about it. It's a good haircut. We could put our heads together and moon some people. Um, oh, that's probably, never mind, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, but here, here, listen, listen. I can't be, I got to be me. I got to be me. I can't be T.D. Jakes, you know, get ready. <laughs> I got to be me. I can't be Joel Osteen. <laughs> Amen. I love that. Every day is a Friday. Uh, I got to be who God created me to be. The other day, the other day someone introduced me. They said, what's Dave Martin like? And, and someone said, he's kind of a mixture between Joel Osteen and Larry the Cable Guy. So that, I'm like, what in the world does that look like, you know? Just hold your Bible up with me and say this, get her done. You know, I don't know. But, uh, but here's what I'm trying to say is life is a gift. And it's up to me to unwrap this gift and enjoy it to the fullest. We're moving into a brand new year. How many are expecting a great year in 2014? And so this is a year. This year is a gift. How do we unwrap it? Every day is a gift. We were just given 365 brand new gifts, new days. People say, how do I have a great year? Well, it's really simple. All you got to do is figure out how to have a great day. Have seven of those and you have a great week. Four of those, you got a great month. Twelve of those, you got a great year. Pretty soon, you got a great life. But there's just some simple principles in God's Word that will help us. I want to talk to you about a few of those uh, today. If you got your Bible, uh, open it. What an honor it is for me to be here and celebrate uh, with you the, the, this Sunday. And, and the beginning of a new year. I love the beginning of New Year's. Like I said, gifts. Love gifts. Life is a gift. This year is a gift. Today is a gift. A couple of Christmases ago, I bought my mother-in-law a gift. For Christmas, I got her a cemetery plot for my mother-in-law. And so I was, that's my mother-in-law. Anyway, anyway I, I didn't get her anything last year, so she was mad, you know. You didn't get me anything for Christmas this year. I'm like, you didn't even use what I, I, I got you. The last. I'm just saying, I'm just saying, when you get someone a gift, you know, you want them to use it. And so here's this gift called life. How do we unwrap it? If you got your Bible, go to Ephesians. What an incredible uh, honor and blessing it is for me to be at Influencers Church. And, uh, man, it's so exciting to see what God's done in just a short amount of time. But just knowing what is coming and what's happening, you are a part. If you're not plugged in here, I mean, I'm telling you, there's no better place to get hooked up. We love we love your pastors. We believe in them. And, and we haven't spent days and years. We've known each other for a long time, but I mean, just, just, I don't even know if they know this, but just a few, about a year ago, my wife and I were really contemplating. We based our ministry in Orlando, Florida, and, and just really praying about what God had for us, and, and we were about, we were down to about three, three places we felt like God wanted us to go, and one of them was to move to Atlanta and be a part of what God was doing here at Influencers Church. Another one was to be with Joel Osteen in Houston, and one was to go to Seattle, and we ended up feeling like God had us just stay in Orlando, but, but we believe in what God's going to do here, what God is doing, and what God's going to do, and you are a part of something amazing. What You're just seeing the baby infant stage of what is getting ready to really be an amazing church in this country, in this city, and in this country. And so what an honor it is for me to get to be here. Thank you guys for uh, for having me. Let me hang out with you this weekend. Um, everything is just great. Love it. I love it. I like Atlanta. It's a, it's a great city, Atlanta. I remember last time I was here, I was uh, I was at the uh, an hotel downtown. I got on the elevator, and this lady got on the elevator with me, and, and she was on the elevator, and we were talking for a second. She goes, you know, you look just like my third husband. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, wow. 
You know, I'm like, how many times have you been married? And she said twice. I, I, I didn't know, but I didn't know what that meant. But anyway, um, Atlanta, what a great city. Ephesians chapter 3. Look at this real quick. Ephesians chapter 3. I want to read this scripture from the Amplified Bible. I'm going to read it from the Amplified Bible because I love the way it says it here in the Amplified Bible. It's a, it's a scripture most of you have probably heard before. But um, there's a word in the Amplified version that just kind of jumped out at me the other day. And I want to just challenge you with it here at the beginning uh, of a brand new year, the beginning of a new start. I just want to kind of challenge you with this word. Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 20. And it says this. It says, now to him, and I'm reading it, like I said, from the Amplified. So there's a lot of extra words in, in here, adds in extra words. But I used to never read the Amplified Bible because I thought it was a girl Bible. Yeah, Joyce Meyer used it all the time. You know, so I figured it was a girl Bible, but it's not. I like it. It just adds a lot of extra words, which is kind of like a girl Bible. It's a lot of extra words. Okay. So now to him, it says now to him, Ephesians 3, verse 20, now to him by in consequence of the action of his power that is at work within us. Isn't it good to know God's power is working in you? Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. That's awesome to know God's power is at work in us. And it, with that, he's able to carry out his purpose and do super abundantly. I like that word there in the Amplified. Super abundantly. How many want to see God do some super abundant things in your life this year? I mean, how many like to be uh, more happy than you are right now? How many like to have more love in your home than you have right now? More joy. How many like to have more peace in your mind than you have right now? Yeah. How many like to have more money than you have right now? Oh, look at all you selfish people. It's all wanting more stuff. No, the, the desire for more is not a wrong desire. It's not an evil desire. It's a, a God desire. He said right here, he wanted to do super abundantly, more joy, more peace. The first command God gave humans was be fruitful in what? Multiply. Multiply means to increase. So the very first thing God said is I want you to be more than you are right now happier, more joyful, more peace, more finances. I mean, that's the first thing he said. You can look in the New Testament, and God doesn't even like things that don't increase. So if it's not becoming more, he gets, he gets upset. I mean, it didn't matter if it was a fig tree, remember that story, or if it was a man with one talent that didn't increase it. God does not like things that don't increase. So God's heart is for us to increase, our lives to increase, our families, for this church, for our church to increase. That's God's plan. And so when you understand that, you look for ways to, to be more blessed in every area of your life. And people say, well, you're talking about money. I don't know if you should talk about money at church. I mean, money's evil. That's what the Bible says. It's money's the root of evil. Is that, what it, is that what it says? No, we know it's not what it says. It says the, right, the love of money. Money itself is the root of, I don't know, good vacations. The other day, someone said, you know, money's not the key to happiness. I said, that's true, but if you got enough money, maybe you get a key made. I don't know. Um, listen, money's not even supposed to make you happy. I mean, that's not even the purpose of money. The Bible said in his presence is where you find joy. So joy and, and happiness, that's all found in God's presence. All money is is a tool. That's all it is, just a tool. A hammer is a hammer. A hammer's not a good hammer or an evil hammer. It's just a hammer. How you use the hammer makes it good or makes it evil. Yeah, right? Same with my money. My money is not good or evil. Money is just money. It's just a thing. But how I choose to use it makes it good or makes it evil. Right? I could, I could use it next week. I saw Christine Kane's coming. What an incredible ministry she has uh, uh, to, to reaching out and to human trafficking and all that. I could take my money and I could build a home to rescue girls from human trafficking. Makes it good, uh, good money. Or I could take my, my hammer. My, my tool, build a home to rescue girls, makes it a good hammer. Same hammer could build the house that abuses the girls, the brothel that abuses the girls. The same hammer is just how I choose to use it, whether it's good or whether it's evil. And the same with the resources that God blesses me with. I can use it to build God's house. I can use it to, to help us with a, a get a new building. Whatever it is that God puts on Pastor's heart, what are we going to do? I can use it for that or I can use it for my own selfish gain. It's what I choose to do with the resources God blesses me with. I mean, wouldn't it be amazing? Pastor goes, hey, we look, we found a building. We're going to have our own building now, and we just need to raise, I, I'm just going to make up a number, $2 million. Just, I mean, and that's just to get us in there or something. I don't know. But how many like to be able to go, hey, hey Pastor Ashley, uh, Pastor Jane, put me down for 100000 How many like to be, it's not a pledge or anything. I'm just asking. <laughs> People are getting nervous. They're like, are these pledges? Is this a, what are we going? I'm just asking. How many like to be able to do that? 
Look at all those hands. Of course, we would like to, but how I many know you can't do that unless you have $100,000? You've got to be blessed in order to be a blessing. Heard about a church got a telephone call, and the secretary answered the phone, and the guy on the other end said, I'd like to speak to the head hog at the trough. The secretary said, excuse me, are, are you talking about our pastor? He said, yeah, that's who I'm talking about, the head hog at the trough. She said, that's rude. That's our pastor. We love him. We respect him. We honor him. We don't talk about him like that. Can I help you with something? And the guy said, yeah, I heard about the new building you're getting up there at the church. I just wanted to make a $100,000 donation. And the secretary said, well, why didn't you say so? Uh, hold on. Let me see if Porky's in. Um, see, I'm blessed to be a blessing. So the more blessed I am, the greater blessing I can be. And I, I can remember in my life, and I, I, I practice, I, I love to practice giving all the time. I mean, the other day I'm at, I'm at uh, Taco Bell, me and my little boy are at Taco Bell, and the lady next to us is planning a birthday party. Her and her little boy, he's maybe nine or ten years old, and, and they're planning his birthday party, and he has a list of 12 friends he wanted to invite. She said, you can invite 10 friends to the party. He said, but I want to invite 12 friends. She said, look, I can only afford this many pizzas. There's this many slices. That's this many friends. And, and really kind of broke it down. And as I'm listening to the conversation, I mean, she's getting frustrated because, I mean, she's a mom. She wants to give him the best, wants him to have all of his friends. And he's getting frustrated because, I mean, he's 9 or 10 years old. He doesn't understand money and all that kind of piece, slices of pizza and all that stuff. He just wants his friends there. And they're, they're getting upset with each other. And I hear the whole thing. And it really all came down to money. They just didn't have the money. Well, if you understand God's blessings on your life, God blesses you to be a blessing. When he blesses you, he's got a lot more than you in mind. So he blessed me so I can help others all the time, so I can be a blessing to my house, to the house of God. To, and so I remembered I had a $100 bill in my pocket. So I just got up and walked over to the table, me and my little boy. I said, excuse me. I said, I don't mean to interrupt you, your, your meal here. I wasn't, I wasn't eavesdropping on your conversation. I was just listening to it. I said, but I heard about the party, and look, I, I put the $100, but I said, look, let him invite those other two friends, and you guys just have a great party. God bless you. And I just turned around and walked out because it, it wasn't about me. You know, it wasn't like, hey, here's, uh, um, here's $100, and here's my card. Um, check out my YouTube channel, and uh, follow me on Instagram. You know, check out my Twitter. No, it wasn't about me. By the way, check out my Instagram. Follow me on Twitter. But, but listen, that wasn't what it, I just turned around and walked out. She's like looking like, who was that guy? You know, I'm sure she probably got home told her friends, you're not going to believe this. I'm sitting there in Taco Bell, and this big bald angel showed up with $100. See, I'm blessed to be a blessing. And so when you get that right in your heart and you understand that God wants to do some super abundant things. I love what it goes on to say there in Ephesians 3.20, far over and above. Wow, he wants to do more than I could even think. It goes on to say more than we could dare, ask, or think. I like in the Amplified, it says that, dare. Now, I grew up in Mississippi, and, uh, and when we, we, we dare people in Mississippi. We not just dare them, we would double dog dare them. How many know what I'm talking about there? Yeah, and look, God's saying, look, I'm going to give you far over and above all that you would dare, ask, or think. I don't know about you, but I'm a pretty big thinker. I mean, I serve a pretty big God. And if we knew how big our God was, if we really believed with him, all things are possible. If we really believed what the Bible said, we would think bigger. We would believe bigger. We would dream bigger. The great theologian um, Donald Trump said this. He said, if you're going to be thinking anyway, you might as well think big. We should, be think we should be the biggest thinkers on the planet. Christians, believers, Christ followers, we should be dreaming bigger, thinking bigger. And he said, look, whatever, however big you think, however big you ask, whatever it is, whatever you'll dare do. He said, I'm going to do super abundantly, far over and above that high, infinitely beyond your highest desires, prayers, thoughts, hopes, or dreams. That's pretty amazing right there. How many believe the Bible? Okay, well, then you see it right there. That's what he's saying. So here's what I'm going to do. Real quick, here's what I want to do for you this morning. And I, I, how, much, how much time do I have left here? Uh, in, the, in the words of um, Kim Kardashian to her last husband, um, I won't keep you long. Okay? But I, I got a couple of things. I got a couple of things that will help you if you'll listen to me right here. Here's what I, wa I want to do. Let's take that word dare. Let's take that word dare. D-A-R-E. 
D-A-R-E. This is real simple, just D-A-R-E. I'm going to teach you a little acronym. This will help you remember. How many ever have a hard time remembering stuff? Yeah, I do too. So that's why I like to teach like this. So four things, D-A-R-E. I'm going to dare you to make 2014 your best year yet. There's four simple things you can do, four simple things that will help you make this. So I'm I'm not going to just dare you. I'm going to help you bring that dare to pass. I'm going to help you make 2014 your best year yet. So if you got your pen, you got your uh, uh, phone or whatever, just write D-A-R-E. Reminds me of these two old guys were talking one day, and and uh, one of them said, man, I just took my wife to this restaurant the other day, and it was amazing. This is just how, why I like, to, how it helps me remember. And so so he, he said uh, the place was awesome. I mean, the food was incredible. The service was out of this world. The atmosphere was, oh, I mean, he goes, man, you know what? He goes, I was just thinking my anniversary is coming up, and I was looking for a place to take my wife. This sounds like the perfect place. He said, it is. It's a perfect place for an anniversary. He said, great. What's the name of it? And the guy said, that's, that's the problem. I, don't, I can't remember the name of the place we went to. He said, what do you mean you don't remember the name? He said, you just described it perfectly. He said, I remember it perfectly, but I can't remember the name. He said, but I, I got to take my wife. What? Come on. He goes, oh, wait, 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 wait a minute. I got an idea. I think I remember. I can remember. What's that, ro- that, that flower that you give on Valentine's Day? The long stem. It's got the thorns. It's red. And, and, uh, and the guy said, a rose? He said, yeah, that's it. Hey, Rose. What's the name of that restaurant that we, okay, this is just to help you remember, okay, so this will help you uh, remember. D, the letter D, dare, anything that we dare, ask, or think. First of all, D, decide that it can be your best year. It's pretty simple. Make a decision. Decide that things can get better. Decide that tomorrow can be different than today. Decide that 2013 or 14 can be better than 2013. Decide to be positive. Decide to get wisdom. Decide. Make a decision. I decide today was going to be a good day. Every day I have that decision to make. You got a choice every morning when you wake up, good morning, Lord, or good Lord morning. And you start right then by deciding how your day is going to go. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice. That's my choice. I I decided to rejoice and be glad in it. So when you begin to understand your decisions matter, the average person makes about 2,500 decisions every single day. Some decisions aren't a big deal. Other decisions can really change your future or change your destiny. A decision to get wisdom. How many want this year to be better than last year? Yeah, we all do. Okay. So what's going to be different this year? How am I going to make this year different, this part of this year different than last year? I'm going to have to do some things different this year. If I want tomorrow to be different than today, I've got to learn something today in order to make tomorrow different. If I go into tomorrow with the same information I have today, I won't have a tomorrow. I'll just have a longer today. So I try to learn something every single day. Plus, the Bible tells me, Proverbs chapter 1, verse number 5, that if you're smart, it says a wise man or a wise woman will increase in learning. So if you're smart, you'll want to get smarter. How many like to be smarter than you are right now? Yeah, look, most of us. So I want to look for ways to learn, and there's wisdom for every area of our life. The only problem you'll really ever have is a wisdom problem. You don't really have financial problems. You just have some wisdom problems. If you'd have known the right things, you wouldn't have got the position you were in. A lot of times we don't have marriage problems. We have wisdom problems. We don't have health problems. We have wisdom problems. And the more wisdom you get, the less miracles you'll need. A lot of people are believing for miracles when if they'd have got some wisdom, they'd have never ended up in the position they were in. Now, I thank God for miracles. I believe in miracles, but I can think back a lot of times, man, if I'd have known back then what I know now, I'd have never even ended up in this position. And there's wisdom for every area. The Bible's got wisdom for everything that you need. Relationships. How many married people are in here? Okay, good. A lot of married people in here. Uh, how many single people? Single people. Okay, good amount of single people. So, and, and whether you're married or whether you're single, there's wisdom in God's word. And whatever, and here's some wisdom for you. Whatever season you're in, just enjoy that one. You know, you see single people looking at married people. Oh, I wish I was married. I have someone to share things with. Then you see married people looking back at single people. Oh, freedom, freedom, freedom. Look, whatever season you're in, just make the most of that season. 
single people. A friend of mine was believing for a wife, and someone said, have you ever made a list of all the things you want in a woman? He said, no, I never made a list. She said, you need to make a list. God doesn't even know what you're looking for. He said, I never thought about that. So he wrote down all the things he wanted in a woman. She said, she saw him the next day. She said, did you make a list? He said, I did. She said, let me see it. And he pulled out 14 uh, pages of, of paper. She was like, my goodness. So that's a lot of stuff there. She said, did you show that to God? He said, I did. She said, what did God say? He said, God said, if he could find a woman like that, he'd probably get married, you know. <laughs> be realistic, but be specific, you know, just... I mean, there's everything you need in the Bible. That's what I love about the Bible. There's even good pickup lines. If you're single, there's good pickup lines in the Bible. It's everything. Like the other day, I was reading the book of Numbers, and I realized I don't have yours. Like, see, that would be a Christian pickup line. You could use that. It's right there. Like, anyway. How many married people are in here? Married people? How many married people? Let me ask you this. You, how many of you and your spouse are totally different? Look at all those hands. My wife and I are night and day different. We're night and day. She's from New York. I'm from Mississippi. Different. She's a northerner. I'm a southerner. Different. They grew up wealthy. We grew up poor. Different. We, well, we thought you're supposed to be poor because poor people go to heaven. That's what they told us growing up. How many heard that kind of stuff growing up? Look at all those. Yeah, we did everything we could to stay broke. We were trying to get to heaven. We were so poor, my parents told us if the ice cream truck was playing music, they meant they were out. That's you know what I'm saying? That's horrible, you know? Like for Christmas, they'd, Christmas, they'd give us batteries, say toys not included, you know, like stuff like that. But, but here's, here's the thing. I began to find out God had more for me, but we were night and day different. We needed some wisdom to work that out. Whatever area you need wisdom. Proverbs 2 goes on to say that the Lord would grant you a spirit of wisdom. Proverbs 3 says that wisdom is more valuable than silver, more profitable than gold, more precious than rubies. And nothing you could wish for would be as valuable as wisdom. Proverbs 4 says whatever you do, get wisdom. Whatever you do, get wisdom. Like I said, I try to learn something every single day. How do you get wisdom? Three ways. Let me give you three ways you can get wisdom. Three ways to get wisdom. So I try to learn something every, every day. I learned the other day, you're more likely to get shot by a fat cop if you run. Something I learned the other day. Um, just, a little, just a little wisdom for you. I'm just saying there's always something to learn, right? I learned not everybody spells their name the same. Like, I like, I'll be in the back afterwards. I like to sign books. I'll tell you about a couple of things I forgot to tell you about. Uh, a couple of things that will help you um, and just some resources. But I like to go back and sign books. So, Pastor Ashley, sign books. You know, there's people, there's all kind of ways to spell names. I mean, they're, you know, Amy, there's like four ways to spell Amy or Cheryl. Uh, C-H, the next lady, it's S-H. You know, all these different ways. So I'm in Starbucks, and there was a new girl in there. And so we were talking for a second. She had her badge on, you know, trainee, her trainee badge on. And so I was just kidding with her because I'm like, that's funny, you know. You, your mom named you trainee. And she had the, the badge on it. And, uh, and she looked at me. She said, it's Trené. And I'm, I was like, how, how in the world would I have known that? You know what I'm saying? So there's always, there's always something to learn. And so when you understand the value of wisdom, whatever you do, get wisdom. Whatever you do, get wisdom. So how do you get wisdom? How do you get wisdom? Three ways. Number one, you can get wisdom from mistakes. That's one way to get wisdom, get it from mistakes. That's the slowest way to get it. But that is one of the ways you can get it. You can get it from making mistakes. We've all made mistakes. How many have ever learned from your mistakes? Okay, good. That's one way to get wisdom. Second way to get wisdom, it's a way I would prefer. How many would rather get your wisdom from Pastor Ashley or Pastor Jane's mistakes? Yeah. I would much rather learn from their mistakes than learn from my own. That's called mentorship. So God places them in our life. There are mentors. There are coach. There are pastors. There are, are trainers. They're kind of all those things together. They're helping us so we don't have to make the same mistakes. I called one of my mentors the other day. I said, I'm thinking about doing this, this. What do you think? He said, I wouldn't do it. I said, why not? I think it's a great idea. He said, yeah, so did I. He already did it, found out it didn't work, saved me a lot of time. And so when you understand God places mentors in your life, trainers. How many have ever worked out with a trainer? Anybody in here ever worked out with a trainer? Okay, quite a few people. I've got a trainer, obviously. You didn't think this is natural, did you? Someone asked me the other day if I had any tattoos. 
And, and, and they were, and I said, I said, I don't have any tattoos. They go, are you against them? I said, I'm not against them, but, you know, you wouldn't put a, a bumper sticker on a Ferrari. Okay, some of y'all get that later. But hey, listen, listen. God places them in our life. A good trainer, what a good trainer does is a good trainer pushes you or stretches you to become more. Like, like you would do two more. He's like, you can do three more. And the last one, the one you'd have never done, that's the one that hurts the worst. But that's also the one that causes the most change to take place. So if you've been around here very long, hopefully you felt stretched a little bit. Hopefully you felt pushed a little bit, not in a bad way, but because they want to help you develop and become your very best, become everything God wants you to be. So God puts them in our life, trainers. Third way to get wisdom is you can buy wisdom. I love that. You can buy what, what took a man years and years to figure out, 30 years to figure out. You can go to Barnes & Noble and buy a book for $20 and learn in two hours. So that's why God gives us wisdom. He gives us books and all that kind of stuff so we can learn. We can buy Wisdom. Plus, he said it's more valuable than silver, it's more profitable than gold, it's more precious than rubies. Whatever you do, get wisdom. So make a decision. Make a de- I was at a meeting one time with a guy. Uh, I'm sure you guys, well, he's from, he's from Australia, Adelaide, uh, Peter J. Daniels. I was at a, meet- a meeting this guy, Peter J. Daniels, did. I went to a seminar a few years back, several years back. It cost me about $3,000 to get to the to place. I get there, and he's teaching and, and, and sharing. And, and um, I mean, he's doing better than I'm doing, so obviously he knows something I don't know. So I'm listening, because how many like to be doing better than you're doing right now? Okay, if you're not doing as well as you'd like to be doing, all that means is there's something you don't know. So when I heard that, I went from being a learn-it-all, uh, from being a know-it-all to being a learn-it-all. Some people think they know it all. You ever notice that? It's like always your broke cousin that knows everything. So obviously he's doing better than me, so he knows something I don't know, so I'm listening to what he's saying. At the end, he goes, I got some book CDs, make yourself available. He told us what he had back there. So as soon as it was over, I ran back to the table. I said, give me everything. They said, you want everything? I said, everything. He knows something I don't know. They said, if you buy everything, it's $1,600 for everything. I said, that's fine. I'll take it all. My friend with me said, you're crazy. $1,600 for some books and tapes and CD stuff. He goes, you think it's worth it? I said, I don't know, but I think I'm worth it. See, I don't buy a book because I think the paper's worth it. I buy it because I think I'm worth it. That's what I love about your pastors. They write books. They make these materials. They make these things available because they want to help you, and they understand the power of that information getting into your life. And so, so anyway, I bought, I bought it all, $1,600. My friend thought I was crazy, but I thought I was worth it. So you got to believe you're worth it. Three ways to see yourself. You can see yourself the way other people see you, which may be good, but then again, it, it, it may not be. But what other people think about you is really none of your business. Quit worrying about what everyone else thinks. How you see yourself, it's important. You want to have a good confidence, self-confidence. But again, we've all had things happen to us that affect our self-esteem. People say things to us, do things. How many of you have ever had someone do something or say something that affected your self-esteem? Yeah, most all of us. I mean, I used to have really low self-esteem. One time I painted a blue square in my backyard just so Google Earth would think I had a pool. That's really low self-esteem, you know, and you just, I don't even know Google Earth. One time in high school, a girl broke up with me. She goes, I'm breaking up with you. You got low self-esteem. I'm like, great. That helped. <laughs> yeah. Another time, this girl called me. She said, come over to my house. Nobody's home. I went over there. There wasn't nobody home. <laughs> that hurts. You know, that's hurtful to your self-esteem. And so, look, I can look at how other people see me. I can look at how I see me. Or I could get a picture of myself the way God sees me. And when you begin to see yourself the way God sees, that's a whole other message. But I'm telling you, I, I felt that I was worth it. I, I developed not just a confidence, but a Godfidence. I'm not just knowing who I am, but knowing whose I am. And it began to change everything. So I, be, I began to feel I was worth it. I bought everything. Anyway, I bought that, that whole $1,600 worth of stuff. I got one idea off of there that, that I, I put the idea together and sold it. Within, with one idea, I made over $300,000 off of one idea. From, how many think a $1,600 investment was worth a $300,000 idea? See, you'll always invest in what you find valuable. Oh, how many be happy? Yeah, y'all aren't very happy about my three hundred thousand dollar idea. How many be happy if you got a three hundred thousand dollar idea? That's what I thought. How many be happy with just like a fifty thousand dollar idea? How many just hope you have an idea before you? So decide. Decide that this year can get better. Here's another one. A, accept responsibility. Accept responsibility. 
lot of times we're always waiting for it. It's always someone else's fault. Someone else's fault. It's the government's fault. It's the economy's fault. It's, our, it's poor parenting. We could always blame someone else for our problems. But the greats learn how to take responsibility. People that, that really do a lot in life. They, they say, you know, the other day I'm at the doctor's office. He told me I need to lose 20 pounds. I said, well, that's my wife's fault. You know, I could blame her. She's Italian. She cooks with breads and pastas and gained all this weight. It's her fault I gained the weight. I could blame Krispy Kreme donuts for, you know, the red light. It's their fault. You know, it's distracting. And, and, but my decision yesterday to eat the donut got me the place I am today, 20 pounds overweight. So my decision starting today or tomorrow, I don't know what we're doing for lunch or anything, but, uh, but um, you know, that begins to shape my future. So I've got to make decisions this year. I've got to accept responsibility. Maybe there's some things I need to do different this year that I didn't do last year. We can always blame other people for our problems, or we can choose to take responsibility for our thoughts, for the things that we think and the things that we do. Oh, my goodness, I'm running out of time. Let me give you the, the what's the next one? R, R. Oh, I love this one. Respond with generosity. How many like giving? Let me see if you like giving real quick. Wow, look at all those hands that like giving. Why do we all like giving so much? Well, it's real simple. Because God created us in his image. For God so loved the world that he what? He gave. He is a giver. And so he created us to be like him, so we are givers. We love to give. Giving is part of who we are. He loved the world so much that he gave what? His only son, right. He gave his only, not just any, it wasn't like he had a bunch of sons. It was his only. Think about that. He only had four sons, and he's like, man, that second one, whew, we've had it. Take the second one. We, no, it was his only, it was his only son. He gave me his very best. I think about that every time I have an opportunity to honor God. When pastor gets up and gives us an opportunity to honor God with our tithe and offering, he gave me his very best. Now, I grew up in church. We learned about tithe and offering. Like we, pastor, but we, we didn't learn about it quite as, as, as the way pastor teaches it here. But we learned, boy, you better pay your tithe or, or God will kill you. Anybody learn like that? Let me see if you learn tithe. Yeah. Well, you know, it was like we went to kids' church. They taught us songs in there. You know, God will take it out of your hide if you don't pay your tithe. You know, uh, to us, it was like God was like the godfather of the mafia, and tithe was like protection money. You know, just give him his money. He won't break your leg. Um, we didn't learn the joy of, of giving, you know. It was like, can you pass the money test? And there's a joy, there's a spirit of generosity beyond all that. I mean, yeah, it's a principle in God's word, but it's not like God's pace in heaven today going, oh, man, I hope Dave tithes. Oh, we just got new robes for these angels. We have to pay for this stuff somehow. No, it, it, it's, it's a test. Now, don't get me wrong. It's a test. The Bible said that. It said test me or prove me in this and see if I'm not telling you the truth. All he's saying is, look, try it. He knew. How many believe the Bible? Let me see your hand again. Okay, good. We all believe the Bible. How many believe God wrote it to help us? Look, we all believe he wrote it to help us, but I bet you we all don't tithe in here. I mean, I'm just saying. I mean, he, we believe the Bible, and we believe he wrote it to help us, but on this part, I'm not sure about that part. That's why he, looked, that's why he said, look, trust me. Because really, it's not about money, because God doesn't need my money. How many believe God owns everything? If he owns everything, he doesn't need my money. He owns everything. But he does need something. Well, that's what the test is about. It's not a money test. It's a trust test. It's a trust test. When I honor God, all I'm saying is, God, I trust you. I believe your word. I believe what you said. I believe you want to help me, and you gave me this to help me. So I'm going to trust you, and I'm going to bring back a portion to him. Maybe you've never trusted him like that before. Maybe you've never been faithful and committed to honoring God. And God puts us in a house like this, and, and he uses that to help build the house. But he uses us with our gifts and our talents and our abilities and our resources to build his house. So I honor him by bringing back a portion to him. And then he says he opens up windows of heaven, pours out blessings on my life and, and all the great benefits that come with it. But mostly it's all about saying, God, I trust you. How many trust, how many trust God? Yeah. I mean, we're all trying. It's hard sometimes. I understand that. But it, it's really what it's all about. It's all about the trust. And then above that, we have opportunities to give, to give generously, to give. How many would like to be able to give more this year than you gave last year? Of course, our heart is all to do that. Of course, we'd love to be able to give more. I remember, I remember, and I'm, I'm going to close with this. I got, what, I got one more to tell you, and I'm going to close. But let me, let me give you my story real quick. 15, 16 years ago, my wife and I just got married. We lived in a little uh, government-assisted apartment, Section 8 housing. Just starting our ministry, you know, Dave Martin International. <laughs> People laugh. It's like international. Where y'all been? 
we had, we ain't, we'd never been anywhere, but we had a vision, you know. And so we just started. We had a little ministry. I mean, I I did everything. Answer my own phone, you know. Dave Martin International. How may I help you? Can I speak with Dave? Uh, one moment, please. <clears throat> Hello, this is Dave. I did everything. I used to lay hands on people, run behind them, catch them. You know, that's a that's a really small ministry. Anyway, when you got to do all that, but. But here's the thing. We begin to follow these principles with honoring God with our tithe. Above that, we'd bring God an offering. Now, all we had at that time was $2. I remember Pastor, Pastor, Pastor Ashley, $2. But I said, you know what? That's all we got. But we got to start with something. Because your increase doesn't come through your tithe. That's just obedience. That's just trust. Above that is where God begins to bless you. And so I bring $2. Months, we went, gave $2. Pretty soon, we were able to give $5. We gave God $5. Pretty soon, we gave $10. God started blessing us. We were able to give $100 one time. They were taking a missions offering, $100 in the offering, all at one time, not a pledge, just a whole hundred. It was huge. I called my dad. He was shocked. But God blessed us. I remember the first time I gave $500 above my tithe. God began to allow us to be generous, this spirit of generosity. I remember sitting in the service. Actually, this service, a preacher was talking about a, a building thing that they were doing, and he said, he said I'm, I'm believing uh, uh, for several people in here to give $500 in, in the offering. And I remember sitting on the second row thinking, wow, $500. Hope God speaks to them. I didn't want to be one, just whoever they were. All of a sudden, I felt like God said, you're one of them, give 500 I said, oh, shoot. I started to reach for my checkbook about the time the guy next to me said, I'm one of them. I said, whew, I guess I overheard God talking to him. And I put my 500 back in my pocket, and, and uh, my wife leaned over and says, God telling you anything? I said, I don't know. Is he telling you anything? She said, I think we're supposed to give 500. I said, oh, shoot. I remember I looked at my checkbook. I had $503. When you have $503 and God wants 500 of it, you know, you want to. Make sure he knows what he's doing, you know. I, mean, I kind of leaned my checkbook up toward heaven so he could see how much I had. He said he already knew how much I had. That's why he didn't tell me to give more. So I'm writing the check, 500 ink is smearing from the tears, you know. You know, all that stuff. God loves a cheerful giver. Whatever. You know, this is everything I had. People are like, you shouldn't cry when you give to God. I said, I'm not. I'm just watering my seed. Just watering my seed. I tell you this, if you're happy every time you give, you don't give a lot. So a lot of times I hadn't been happy about it. But I remember giving that 500 didn't I? And I could go on and tell you our story. I remember the first time we gave 1000 I remember the first time we gave 5000 I remember the first time we gave, oh, 2500 I remember that one. It was at the building fund at our church. I remember enjoying the praise and worship. And all of a sudden God said, you know the money you've been saving for your car? I said, yeah. He said, put it in the building fund. Man, I turn the music up. I try to drown that. I try to drown that out. And uh, but I, I could tell you the first time we gave ten. I remember we were, our church was building a new youth center, three point two million. We're sitting in service, and my wife leans over and says, "I think God wants us to give twenty five thousand to the youth center." I said, "Oh, I don't feel that." I was praying about it a couple days later, and the, and the Holy Spirit said, "Will you give twenty five thousand? And I said, "If I had it, I'd give it." He said, "That's all I need to know is that you would." When I knew you would, he said he would supply seed to the sower. So he said, when I know you want to be generous, I'll find ways to bless you. When your heart is to be generous, he looks for ways to bless you, to bless your business, the promotion on the job, the sale to go through, whatever it is, he's looking for ways to bless you so you can be a greater blessing. Because how is he going to build his house? Through us. How is he going to build an influencer's church? Through us. Through blessing us so that we can be a blessing. But it starts with us being a blessing where we're at. And then he sees that, honoring him with our tithe, showing him we trust him. And then above that, being generous with our offering. I remember 50000 I remember the first time God spoke to us. And, and we'd, we'd set a goal this like, several years before to give $100,000. And we were able to give our first $100,000 to build the house of God. I would love to, how many like to uh, not make a million, how many like to be able to give a million dollars? Wouldn't that be amazing to be able to, I mean, you look at people like Warren Buffett and Ted Turner gave a billion dollars to the UN. And, and these, I mean, think if we had some believers, some people in the house here that said, you know what, God bless me. I don't want to just be a millionaire. I want to be a kingdom millionaire. I want to use it to build your kingdom. Think what ideas he could do. He could give you what kind of creative invention. I don't know how he would do it, but he would bless you so you could be a blessing. But here's the thing. 
Remember, you're blessed to be a blessing. Put first the kingdom, then everything else. Not about you. Don't ever let it get about you if it gets about you. In the process, it's like a water pipe. The purpose of a water pipe is not to get wet. The purpose of a water pipe is to move water. In the process, it gets wet, but that's not its purpose. The purpose of God's blessings in my life are not to get blessed. They're to be a blessing. In the process of being a blessing, God blesses me, but that can't be my reason for. How many understand what I'm saying? I'm not giving just so I can get some more stuff. It comes, I get it as I give, but he blesses me even more so I can be a greater blessing the next time. Say it one more time. Say, I'm blessed to be a blessing. Let me give this last one. i got to pray for you. I'm out of time. What was the first one, the letter D? Decide. Yeah, decide. This can be your best year yet. Letter A was what? Accept responsibility for what you need to change, what you need to do different, the wisdom you need. To, oh, let me, let me show them that real quick, and then i gotta, I got to give you this last one and pray for you. Um, you got to accept responsibility. Get the wisdom and things that you that you need in your life. We put together some resources and things that will help you. Um, th- and we didn't bring enough of these for everybody because uh, not everybody's into wisdom. But but those who are, we brought a couple things that will help you. Oh, the last letter E, the last letter E is accept, accept, no, that was A, expect, that's the word I was looking for, expect God's favor to show up in your life. Expect, how many like to have more of God's favor in your life? I could teach you favors, one of my favorite things to teach you about, I could teach you on that for forever. Expect God's favor when nothing else seems to be working for you. Or when you've done everything else, you follow the principles of God's word and nothing else seems to be working, expect his favor to be that extra advantage that you need in your situations. We wrote a book called The Force of Favor. I tell you, if you could only get one thing back there, get this book on favor. I'll give you over 100 facts about favor, memory scriptures on the favor of God. Uh, Luke 2.52 said, Jesus increased in favor. How many like to increase your favor? If Jesus was increasing his favor, I I need to increase my favor. So I found the ways to increase your favor, put it all together Uh, in this book. I encourage you to make yourself available to the book, The Force of Favor. And then this is a book I wrote called 12 Traits of the Greats. And I took over 500 hours and studied great achievers. I wrote this book. It's a 288-page hardback book. But to make it easy for people, you know, especially at the beginning of a new year, I think it's important that you, you get coaching and mentorship to help you develop the traits in your life. I found 12 traits that were common among great achievers, whether it's on the baseball field, the battlefield, the business field, the field of life, whether it's a great parent, a great lawyer, a great mechanic. I found these traits. I put them together in this book. Things like responsibility, things like mindset, like passion. Two most important days in your life, the day you're born, the day you discover why. Why are you here? Your imagination, focus. Anyway, 12 different traits, 12 different traits. We put them together. We only brought a few of these. I think uh, I think we only brought a box of these with us. But um, you get the book. You get a workbook that goes with it. You get 12 DVD coaching sessions. We do a lot of coaching with everyone from uh, from NASCAR to Mary Kay Cosmetics. I can't sit down and coach people individually, but we put it all together in this series here. And uh, you get 12 DVD coaching sessions, 12 audio coaching sessions, a workbook, all that kind of stuff together. And uh, and then if you get it, you, they give you this for free. You can't buy this DVD, but you get it for free back there. Um, we filmed this at a little church in Houston that was struggling, and we went in to help them. It's called Lakewood. And, and since we've been there, it's really, things have really exploded there for them and, and, uh, and Joel Osteen. But uh, uh, it's called A Night of Hope and Humor. You can't buy it, but if you get the coaching system, you get it absolutely free uh, back there, and it'll be a blessing just to help you. So we can spend the next 12 weeks together. You got 12 audio sessions in there where you put those in your car, and we'll just spend the next 12 weeks learning these traits of great achievers. All of them are based in God's Word because there's no greater source of success than the Word of God. There's a difference between the person of Jesus and the principles of Jesus. The person of Jesus prepares you for heaven. The principles prepare you for earth. And so you use godly principles. There's ungodly men using godly principles. While the church doesn't know them or ignores them and wonder why we barely make it. Anyway, all that's back there. That's set. We made half price. You can even get it for half price today. We always do it in church. In the corporate arena, it sells for 400 In the church, we do the whole 12-week coaching thing for, for half price. For $200, you get the whole thing. Say thank you. It's half price. You can at least be grateful. Let me pray two prayers over your life pray two prayers over your life. Father, I thank you that you want to do more 
over and above, super abundantly, far more than we could even dare, ask, or think. We take the dare. We take the dare. We've decided today, this year's going to be our best year yet. We're going to accept responsibility for the things that we need to change, get the wisdom that we need to make the changes that we need to make. We're going to respond with generosity. You're going to bless us so we can be a blessing. Lord, I thank you for this incredible house that you're building here. Influencers Church, thank you for letting each one of us be a part of what you're doing. Father, let us respond with generosity. Let us know that the more you bless us, the greater blessing we can be. Lord, let us honor you with our tithe, that portion that belongs to you. Above that, we'll be generous. Some of us, it may be $5 we start with. Others, you've blessed us beyond that. It may be 100 they start with. Lord, the day will come when it's 100000 500,000 or 20,000 because we believe in what you're doing as you bring buildings and land and things to come. Father, we thank you for letting us be a part of a house that's, Lord, touching a city, touching a region, touching the world. Lord, I thank you for uh, Pastor Ashley and Pastor Jane. I thank you for their family, their commitment. What an amazing step of faith and example to all of us. But you put something in their heart. Thank you for letting us be a part of that. Lord, we expect your favor to show up. We've seen it. It's been amazing. But Lord, we know so much more is yet to come.